In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. We listen in the scripture today to familiar stories, that of Lazarus rising from the dead by the command of Christ, and the other is the child who Elias raises from the dead by laying on the child and praying earnestly that God grant the favor to this woman who had shown such kindness to the prophet in giving him a place to stay. And the prophet made the promise that a child will be born to you, and now the child's dead. And so by a great power of resurrection, the child is brought back to life. What we find interesting is in the Old Testament lesson, Elias has to beg the mercy of God to heal this child, to bring this child back to life. Or in the gospel, Jesus commands Lazarus to come forth with an absolute word, which indicates for us, again, another proof, if you like, of the very divinity of our blessed Savior, that he speaks in his own name for Lazarus to come forth. We also recognize in this, and St. Augustine in the office of Matins makes a big deal over this, that this story of Lazarus is really a story of conversion, of those who were dead in their sins and trespasses, who have the good news preached unto them. And through the grace of baptism, <clears throat> this person who was dead is now brought to life. In this, we recognize the free gift of regeneration. How, do we, how are we born again? Well, we don't have to work for it because it's a free gift. It's given to a child on the day they're baptized. What good deed did this child do to inherit this gift of redemption? The child didn't do anything, uh, but rather it was freely given. And so just as we are dead in our sins, God in his mercy took us and gave us new life in the waters of regeneration. Now to remain in the grace of God, though, well, that's where faith and works come in, and we live out our, fear, our salvation in fear and trembling, as St. Paul reminds us. Uh, but we strive to live daily this Christian life, but it always begins by this gracious gift of God. And in Lent, we're reminded uh, that not only are we born again, dead from our sins, but uh, in many ways, even when we sin actually throughout our adult life, uh, once again, we're called uh, to acknowledge Christ, to turn back to Christ. The miracle was wrought for Lazarus in many ways by the uh, instrumentation of his sisters who interceded for him. And so we recognize that heaven intercedes for us. The angels and saints, they pray for us and they encourage us uh, to continue on in our course. And even when we fail, they continue to pray for our redemption. They pray for our conversion, uh, that we might turn back all the more fervently to God. God in his mercy sends from time to time heavenly visitations. Uh, and what do they for always to call us back to God, always to call us to repentance, to call us to a deeper faith. Not only does God grant to us uh, these extraordinary uh, visitations in the form of apparitions, most notably that of our Blessed Lady, uh, but also in phenomena that happen. And you know, if you're following this, there's a, an interesting phenomena that's going to happen. Well, it's not a phenomenon, it happens naturally. And it's called uh, the eclipse. A big eclipse is coming on April 8th in this coming year. And with this eclipse, there's a lot of interesting things that are going to happen. First of all, April 8th this year, uh, even in the old calendar, will be known as the Feast of the Annunciation because the Annunciation, 25th of March, falls in the middle of Holy Week. And so we can't observe the feast. It's such an important feast that it can't be dropped. Most little feasts drop in preference to higher days. But because the Annunciation is such a great rank, it has to be transferred. And so it's transferred to the very next available day. It cannot also be celebrated during the Paschal week. And so it has to be the day after Paschal week, which happens to be Monday, April the 8th. And we find this great phenomena taking place. Now we know in the Annunciation, redemption comes into the world. The word was made flesh, dwelt in the womb of the Holy Virgin Mary. Uh, but we also recognize that St. Gabriel is the one who brings to us the harbinger of the message of God, which is always to repent. And we recognize uh, in our world today the need for repentance. And it's also very interesting because we can go, kind of continue on the analogy. I was listening to a, an article today and I read a little bit more on it. And it was that in this path of this, uh, this particular eclipse that's going to pass over us, it begins by hitting a biblical city as it crosses into the United States. And the name of the biblical city is the city of Jonah. Not a city, it's a little town. But the town of Jonah, spelled the same way, J-O-N-A-H, the city of Jonah. 
And as it continues on its path all the way up into Canada, it passes over seven little towns that are all called Nineveh. Now, that's very interesting. Nineveh was the city that Jonah was sent to preach to. And I looked up and I said, how many cities in America are named Nineveh? And there were only seven. And it's going to pass over all the seven towns called Nineveh. As it crosses over into Canada, it will pass over one city called Nineveh in Canada. And so I looked up and said, how many cities in Canada are called Nineveh? And the answer is one. And so it crosses over all the Ninevehs uh, in the United States and in Canada. Significant, right? We can choke this off as just coincidence, uh, but it's a very interesting coincidence. Uh, we also recognize that the eclipse we had two years ago it went from east to west primarily, and this one goes primarily north to south, and it creates a great cross uh, over the eastern part of the United States. At the very center of that cross, I think it's in Iowa somewhere, uh, there's a little town called Palestine. And so we recognize all these biblical connotations. And, and of course, heaven tells us something. Heaven is trying to communicate to us. And like the Magi, it takes the wisdom of God to recognize the message. And of course, the message is that of Jonah, that we are to repent. Now, Jonah's message was much more urgent. He said, 40 days more and Nineveh will be destroyed. Uh, and so the urgency of Nineveh was great. Now, we're also told by biblical historians that at the time Jonah would have preached around the year 700, AD, 700 BC uh, to the Ninevites, the very time that Jonah came out of the whale, uh, there was a total eclipse that went over the city of Nineveh. Uh, and so that gave even more credence to the words that the prophet would have spoken, calling the people to repentance. And so we recognize even today, uh, coincidence, well, could be, but I think we always have to keep that mind open that God is truly trying to teach us and tell us something. 40 days more, who knows? But the message of Nineveh was 40 days more and Nineveh will be destroyed. But the people repented and God relented in the punishment that he would send. And so we recognize today all these coincidences of all these Ninevehs uh, scattered throughout our country on this one little track uh, beginning in the city of Jonah, uh, significant for us to kind of meditate on uh, and to realize that God is still calling us and will continue to call us to faith and to an ever deeper repentance. Even as he raises Lazarus from the dead, so the Lord raises sinners from the dead. When we turn to him with faith and with hope and with contrition, it was also stated that uh, in the story of Lazarus, St. Augustine rat reminds us that Lazarus comes back to life not only because of the intercession of the two sisters, but because of the activity of the two sisters. And the two sisters represent love of God and love of neighbor. Mary, who sits at the feet of Christ and wishes to learn from Christ. Mary, who wishes to cling to Christ on the day of his resurrection, represents for us that part of our soul which is called to love the Lord with all our heart and soul and mind. And then Martha, who is busy about all the things of hospitality, who showed her compassion and her love for her neighbor. And so we recognize that it's always through those twofold, that twofold virtue, which is really part of one commandment, to love the Lord with all of our heart and mind and soul, and to love our neighbor as ourself. And of course, with this, we have life. With this, we have the very gift of redemption as we persevere uh, in that love. And so we recognize always as Christians uh, that call that God has given to us to live out our Christian faith. Because when we wander from that faith, uh, we will always flounder. I listened to a wonderful quote the other day, and it was a very powerful quote. It was that when God, in the act of creation, when God created the fish of the sea, God addressed himself to the water. He spoke to the water, let the waters bring forth all kinds of fishy, fishes and creatures of the deep, and, they, and so it was. When God created the plants and the trees, God spoke to the earth, and God ordered the earth to bring forth vegetation and all the trees, and all the trees grew up. But when God created man, God spoke to himself. Let us make man in our image. And so we find that if you take a fish out of water, the fish will die. If you pull a plant out of the earth, the plant will die. And if you remove man from God, or if, God, if man removes himself from God, well, what's the final result? That is spiritual death. 
And so we're reminded how nature cooperates in the eternal truth and how we too are called to that eternal truth, which always in Lazarus represents that of not only the rising from the dead, a sinner brought to redemption, not only the hope of rising again at the last day, uh, but also of this continual need for us to rise up from our sinfulness so that we might truly serve God with all gladness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.